All right, the rules of the game are as usual, none. But maybe whenever it is, it seems like a good idea to start. Um, give me about five minutes to just sort of sketch out some things and I'll shut up and you guys take me where you want me to go. And if you don't want me to go there or have had enough, tell me to stop. So it's all in your hands. Oh, there's Suzanne. Oh my Hello. God. Hello, Harrison. There you go. All right. And it says that Dr. Rain is somewhere around. <laughs> She's a great dark figure. Now that's a double. She's just creating thing. trouble. That's what she's doing. That's, good. that's excellent. <laughs> Rain, <laughs> come shower upon us. <laughs> that's all right. Hello, sure. Elena. Hello. Hello. Nice to Hello. see you. Oh, it's been so long because you were at the most recent international house gatherings. I didn't see you in the last year when it was happening. Oh. So I was here yesterday and, and here now. So yes, that counts. Yeah. I, I saw you yesterday, but I wasn't in your group. Ah. So, uh, yes. And I take it, Ryan, that everyone kind of knows that it's going to be in room 18 or someone in the main room will be telling people. I might just put a little uh, a blast mm -hmm. out there and, and mm -hmm. uh, give a reminder. Yeah. Well, it's always true. Whoever comes are precisely the right people. <laughs> uh, so it always works. Uh, how's the weather uh, in Washington, Harrison? Is it cold? It's cold here in Florida today. Mm. It's, I would say, generally miserable. <laughs> generally uh, miserable. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's, you know, it's 12 o'clock by now or one. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we have yet to see the sun. And oh. that's all right. But it's a lot better than California where, my oh, goodness, yeah. they're just drowning. I love it. Look, everybody's popping up. Let's see who we've got. Ralph Pierce, where are you? I see you. I see you see me. Woodlands, Texas. Texas. <laughs> oh, my God. The great state is represented. And Sky, my goodness me, from the great state <laughs> of Maine. <laughs> who else have we got? Well, Lucas, he doesn't count. He's just sort of all over the place. State of confusion. All right, Rain has come out of the closet. Everson. Yes. I took a little break in for nourishment you so did. I could be present. <laughs> well, you're always present. But <laughs> uh, so Harrison, you can tell me. Are you the winner of that one billion three five? You don't have name. to say here. We'll talk later. I can, no, I can tell you with absolute <laughs> total. I am so delighted I'm not. <laughs> I can't think of anything worse that could happen to anybody than to get that much money and then think of all the people's vultures and what have you that are just circling around to say, well, you got a lot of money, baby. Mm, sure. <laughs> so Sky, I take it it's not you either, right? No. <laughs> Where'd she go to, Sky? She was there. Who Maybe is? She went to check her ticket. <laughs> right. Maybe she went to check her ticket. And I see Jeren is here from Canada. Bonjour, uh -huh. That's well, bonjour. Very involved in the peace movement in Canada and beyond. And she was in New York in 2018, I think it was, or 2019. Uh, just before Hunt. the pandemic, Suzanne. So yeah. 2020, I guess. Okay, okay. Uh. Hello, Harry and son. Just want to say hi. Thomas here in Sweden. Good to see oh, you. Hey, Thomas. Hey, hey. hey, hey. <laughs> I always love to see Thomas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have shared many moments of spiritual enjoyment. For sure. <laughs> a lot of it came in a bottle. 
<laughs> in any event, Irene Jenkins. And where are you? I'm in California. Yes, there we go. We still acknowledge you're here as long as you're here, but we're expecting you to disappear shortly. Oops. Hopefully you won't. Where in California? <laughs> uh, Grass Valley. It's in yes. the foothills. Okay. Yeah. Northern foothills. Northern foothills. Well, you're just going to get droused, but that's all right. Yes, it is pouring rain, and it has been for a couple of weeks. You guys now. have been talking about how you want water. Yep. Yeah, and I had <laughs> well, a few words. It. I had a few words with the powers that be, and they turned the spigots on. <laughs> We need all I didn't we can tell get. them how much. I just said you wanted water. And they took me literally, I think. Yeah. Of all course, right. now everybody's complaining about the flooding. So, yeah, well, you know, but we need the water for sure. It's going to be a deep one. All right. Yep. Let's pretend that we're started. Is that agreeable? Yes, all Harrison. Right. And I want you to know you have people here from um, Barcelona, from Vietnam. And a lot of other places, I'm not sure. I, I, I can see some of the people that I know from various different places. The Vietnam, I see my friend there, and Henry, and all sorts of people. Well, as people come and go, say who you are. Let me take five minutes and just sort of, whatever, put out what I think I'm trying to put out. And... From, oh, there's Romy. By God, the UK has joined us. Yes, very nice. And who have we got? Richard Schultz. I, that one don't get. All right. Here's my thing. This is about peace and high performance. And a thought occurred to me that given the state of the world that we're in, reconvening another United Nations with 70 odd people coming to solve the problems of the world won't work. And so I've suggested at odd points that what we really need is a good conversation for 8 billion people. Now, we're not gonna get them all in one room. We can't even do it with a succession of open spaces. It's not going to happen instantaneously, but I firmly believe that the capacity to do that is there. Now, how? And that's for you guys to figure out. Um, but a conversation for 8 billion people, why do that? Well, because we've got so many conflicted issues and interests and places where people come from and places where people don't want to go to that sort of having a select group of 79 convening in San Francisco worked, you know, 50 years ago, it's not going to work now. And how we actually get this conversation going and productive and so forth and so on, I, I think that's the great, wonderful thing that you guys are going to have to figure out. But there always has to be a first step. And the first step, I believe, looking at my own life, um, is what do I personally do, be, or whatever, put in the verb you like, to energize this con conversation for 8 billion people? Now, that's a big order, but I suspect it starts with what I call bursting our bubbles. And it's my own personal experience that all of us, and certainly me, was born in a bubble. And truthfully, we liked that bubble. That told us who we were, the people we should like, it also, as 
the great song from South Pacific said, also taught us all the people we should hate. You people may not remember the song itself, but it goes, you have to be carefully taught to hate and fear all those people your relatives hate, people whose eyes are ugly made, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think any of us escaped that bubble. So the paper I put out there, just if you're going to talk, you got to share where you are, bursting your bubbles, is about my bubble burst. And I have to say it was a hellaciously hellish experience. I don't recommend it to anybody for a nice Sunday afternoon or even Saturday afternoon exercise. It's excruciatingly painful, I just warn you. On the other hand, once you have, and this is just me talking personal, once you have experienced life on the other side of that bubble, it's a very different thing. I mean, all of a sudden you discover as the last 50 or so years since my bubble definitively burst, although it keeps on going, you know, I mean, as I say in that paper, which maybe you read, and if you didn't, it's okay. Uh, my bubble was a wasp, you know, I'm classic. I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant socially registered and at the age of 13, I never knew anybody who didn't show up in the social register. Now, you can't get more protected than that. I mean, I was so privileged, I didn't even know I was privileged. And then there was a wonderful day when my, my whole bubble just fell apart. More often than not, your bubble, you don't want to get rid of it. And so... <laughs> It's a very hard job to say, okay, I'm going to pop my bubble. But ordinarily, the universe takes care of that for you. But you do have some choices. Do I want to see what's outside that bubble? Or do I just want to build it back as fast as I can? That's a choice. In my case, I didn't have any choice. I didn't feel. That bubble just went. But the moment my bubble went, which was all the privilege of being what I was born into, I suddenly discovered there was a massive humanity that I'd never experienced. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, instead of impoverished, my life was so fundamentally enriched that it took my breath away. And I would say very honestly, the sheer joy of it is looking at this polyglot screen from around the world, most of whom I would never know, given my previous bubble. No, I would say all of you. <laughs> you didn't classify. <laughs> Please don't take that as a downput. It's just simply, I, I, I have to look at this and say, this is... You know, this is a totally rich, wonderful, new experience that virtually, not virtually, I'm sure most of the people who shared the bubble I lived in have never had, couldn't believe, and wouldn't know what to do with if they had it. So all I'm saying is maybe the first step in engaging in and sponsoring and supporting this conversation for 8 billion people is to acknowledge the bubbles that we have. And probably next to that is when the universe gives us a major tug and says, wait a minute, the way you're looking at the world is much too small. And your immediate response, I would say my immediate response is say, well, hold on a minute. I want my world back just the way it was. 
take a deep breath and let it go and see where it ends you up. I will guarantee you it'll end you up in no pla in in a place that you've never been before. So for me, the first step in the thoroughgoing practice of peace and a move towards high performance is to <clears throat> understand myself as growing outside of my old bubble. Which raises the question, how do you do that? I mean, because the truth of the matter is that bubble gave us our life. It told Tomas, what's it like to be here in Sedan? Hmm? He, he didn't come from South Africa. And he and Rain didn't grow up together. And Sun Lee, hey, most of us never experienced that. But when the bubble breaks and all of a sudden you're out there in a world or a series of worlds that you could never have imagined, what do you do? I'm not saying a great program that you start. I'm saying with you, what do you do? How should you be? How could you be? when the very things that have always defined you blew away. I don't have any great answers, but I do have five principles and you all know them well. But it suddenly it dawned on me that our great experience with experiment with open space has been an experiment with living. And there have been lessons learned, some of which we like, most of which we don't. But the principles, which were never intended to be or weren't, stated things that we must do, but rather observations, what of what's it like along the way? And you know them as well as I do, I think. Whoever comes are the right people, which reminds us that you don't have to search about for the 100,000 chairmen of the boards to do something. You just have to find people who care. And you know that they care because they're there. This is very complicated. And then we have whatever happens is the only thing that could have, which looks like a totally brain dead observation. But we forget it. We keep worrying about all the things that could have been, might have been, should have been. And so what happens is just blinded to us or whatever, hidden from us. And then we have, whenever it starts, is the right time. I always love it. Every manager is sure that everything has to start on time. And the absolute truth is nothing ever has, ever, in the whole history of time, about which we can't even think. It starts when it starts. It starts when the spirit is up in there and somebody starts and then we have the one wherever it happens is the right place and this was a, a a gift of a good friend from India, uh, Egypt who was telling me about how if you watch the swirling events of Tiamat uh, uh, whatever square in Egypt, come on, help me. Um, or, yeah, or friend from China watching the Tiananmen Square thing. It was open spaces. 
it was swirling masses of people coming together and going apart and coming together and going apart. And if you listen to what the people said, it sounds just like an open space. I've never felt so free. I feel blown away. I have opportunities. I'm being listened to. Amazing. You don't have to, you know, sit in circles. Wherever it happens is the right place. And then the last one is when it's over, it's over. That's a hard one, but our life is, as near as I've always experienced it, it's always filled with endings and new beginnings. And we never get a new beginning until we've had an ending. And so a lot of the great fears we have about endings is really a fear about what? Not being? Yeah, or something. But if you think about it, if if I thought I was going to go to Chicago and for whatever reason, I didn't, I am just as dead to Chicago as if I'd been hit by a subway train. I can never go back to that time place again. And so our life is quite literally filled with endings and new beginnings. Now, when you sort of take all of this not as helpful principles when you're doing an open space and say, well, what, what's really happening here? My experience has been that what's really happening is we're firmly placed in now. I mean, all of a sudden, all of the other things that make different times and different places and different aren't there. And it's not that we are constricted by this time, this place. We suddenly discover that our now gets enormous. Now, the mystics have a, a funny way of talking about this, the Taoists and everybody else that I know of. When you're now as big, when, it, when you finally come to not only an intellectual but a personal recognition that the past is over, the future hasn't happened yet, and all you got is now, Typically, what we do is we get so anxietized, that's a word I made up, <laughs> that, you know, we just make the now smaller and smaller. And all that happens is we get more and more anxious. Which is exactly the opposite of being wide, commodious, open, available for conversations, willing to start, venture into situations where we've never been before. Now, I'm not ever suggesting that this is an easy trip. Uh, <laughs> it's been, but it is wonderful. And There are very few absolutes in my experience, but one is we all are imprisoned by our bubbles. And typically our bubbles are so much a part of us that we can't even see that there are bubbles. And, you know, all of a sudden, because I happen to be Asiatic or Black or whatever, that's who I am. But is that who I am? Um, I, I know an awful lot of you very personally. And absolutely none of you come up in my mind as Asian or African or African American or, God forbid, Swedish. Um, 
or whatever. You come up as people. And it's when, at least for me, <clears throat> when everybody I'm talking to, everybody I'm being with is a person engaged with me now, this is an extraordinarily different world than the world most, I think, people on this planet exist in. And it's, I think, one of the reasons why as many places I've been over, however long I've been going, wherever I went, I never felt a stranger. Even though I... In, in most cases, I couldn't understand a word that anybody was saying because they were talking some language I never heard. Or there were so many of them that even if I did understand the language, it wouldn't have made any sense. Uh, anyhow, there's my thought. The paper is theirs for yours. And... I'm open to go wherever you want to. Or not. I can only add one word to that. What now? Hmm. Right, exactly. Did you ever did you ever think that statements Closed space. Questions. Open space. I mean, I, we have always, and it's. I think it's been a great learning. Open space starts always with a question, not an answer. And unfortunately, I think for most places, for most of us, we live in a world of answers. If you don't have the answers, you're obviously stupid. Well, I rather think if you appreciate the question, you might be on the road to wisdom. That changes, right? Puts us in a different place. So if all the world was appreciated as a question, all our world was appreciated as a question. The interesting thing is the answers are immaterial. Maybe. Harrison, I think bubbles are fractal. I'm sure. I think you bust one, you find yourself in another one. You bust that one, you find yourself in another one. Precisely. And that the bubbles never leave us, but there's always some new bubble to break. Well, I think that may be part of the terror and wonderfulness of being human. We're finite. We can only take one step at a time. Um, but the good news is there are an infinite number of bubbles to break. And each one uh, enriches us. And every time it happens, we suddenly discover ourselves, I find, being more than we ever thought we could have. I mean, I know that sounds like gobbledygook, but, you know, I, I can just say that the many, many times, wherever it was, anywhere in the world, and even though I couldn't understand a word, what I experienced was a whole different understanding of that now, which was related to, but much smaller than, I mean, much bigger than any understanding of now that I'd ever experienced. I 
I mean, it happened. It happens all the time. You're absolutely right. It's fractal. It's it's progressive. Um, and at any given moment, we say, "Well, you know, this is kind of where we are." I happen to be a white Anglo-Saxon, whatever. I still am. And but what's interesting to me is I can show up. Have shown up in totally Islamic situations and have imams come up to me and say, you're a prophet. I haven't a clue what they're talking about, but I do know that I was suddenly in a, in a world that I had had no prior experience of, none. Um, and I would run into friends in China and suddenly discover them saying, you know, well, anyhow, the story goes on, but it goes on all over the world. And it's not just for me that the story happens, it's for all of us. And yes, it's fractal. And yes, it's constantly liberating. And yes, it's constantly restricted. And yes, the choice is constantly ours to say, well, do I want to stop my growing now? Now? In which case, go ahead. <laughs> but that's known as suicide. I Simon think. and Rain. Sorry? Oh, I'm, I'm, Simon and Rain are, are itching to speak. Oh, go ahead. I don't know about itching. Um, I first of all uh, like to say thanks for that. It was um, very uplifting. Um, I, I agree with what Charlie said about fractal. I think that perhaps representational democracy and traditional religion no longer fit the needs of folk and technology is coming to the position where it can provide us with new solutions, but that's going to take a huge shift in mind. Um, so that was just a thought. I, I'll leave you with a last quote or imagined quote that I rather like. It's a quote from the goldfish, and it goes, what water? <laughs> yeah, the goldfish saying, but what water? Yeah. And that's a bubble. Yeah. Well, we're all goldfish. And, you know, what we presume is the environment is what we presume it is. And then the magic of my experience is we discover that's just the beginning. Which doesn't mean dropping into some strange place with thousands of people who have very different physiognomies and languages and cultures and histories and whatever. It isn't a, a shocking experience. It is. But it's also incredible. And to me, it's part of it's part of growing ourselves or allowing ourselves to grow so that we can be actual useful participants in this eight billion conversation or something. Somebody else was doing something in Dr. Rain. Oh God, here we go. <laughs> so Harrison Owen, hmm. I, I, there's something that occurs to me to share. And it's it's not about you. It's about my experience. Of course. And I'm um haven't fully engaged or sorted it out because it came up when you shared about looking at the people on the screen that you've interacted with. And you don't when you you see these people, you're not seeing like the African, the the Swedish person, the black person, all all of that. You're seeing the person, and 
the 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 person. And I I'm remembering when I first met you walking into the big room in a big old circle and just seeing you. And I'm and I've been looking. So that's why I'm sort of hesitating in my speaking. I'm still looking. But I'm gonna say that I feel like you you were are the first white man, quote unquote, who I've ever walked in their space and felt like I was interacted with as a human being. And I had never distinguished that before until you started speaking like what it was about you, that automatic comfort, automatic disappearing of my bubbles around race and all of that was gone. And, and like who I am now, I would say is who you were being transformed who I was being when I walk into the space like that. And, See, they're gifts that go both ways, and it's wonderful. Right. Yeah, so so who you were being transformed, who I was being. And so it's just leaving me in the inquiry and in the question of, like, who am I being in the bubbles that I've created in my life? And so that just leaves me space to look, to keep looking, to keep looking, to keep looking, and... Um, and noticing who I'm being in any one given moment, given circumstances. You know, I'm looking looking back at some incidents I've interacted with and I came to it inside of my bubble. So inside of my bubble, the only thing that could happen was the, well, only a few things could happen. Like looking at transforming that bubble, it expands the possibility. And, uh, that's all I have to say for now. I, I appreciate you and all of that good stuff. You know that. You know, I call you every now and then and make sure you know that. That's all you need to know. You call me out and give me good trouble. I love you. <laughs> yeah, I so, love you. Yeah, another piece that goes in this for me is, is humor. I mean, one of the things that I found is a marvelous bubble booster is when you know we have these stereotypes of things you can say and you can't say and uh, uh, more years ago than i care to think i was working with street gangs in washington and we got real close i mean all the kids i worked with put it together they had hundreds of years of time in the pen and we got along just great and I knew that we crossed some significant barrier where the biggest, oldest, I think he was 17 kid, not just black like coffee black, I mean serious black, looked at me and says, nigger? <laughs> F. Then he looked at me again and he says, I guess you got to be a white nigger. And all of a sudden you discover, or I discovered, that human beings have this odd way of transforming the words we use so that words of hate becomes words of respect. I mean, a major example of that was uh, this funny fellow Jesus and crucified. And one of the major pieces of alchemy in human consciousness to me has been the, the transformation of the crucifixion from a total hateful thing to something that for some people uh, makes the world a different place. But we forget this humor, and humor is a wonderful way to break bubbles. <laughs> and part of the, 
I think the premium or penalty we pay for a lot of our quote correct correct talk is we lose the team humor. I mean, in a very different thing when the feminist movement first broke out and it was, you know, which I, I think was wonderful. But all of a sudden, you know, abusing females in any way, shape, or form was very bold. And yes, I agree. On the other hand, if you were flying the Friday afternoon flight from Washington to Chicago or Chicago to Washington, that was a bunch of guys who have flown that flight every week for weeks and were the same stewardess. And it was a club. And I can remember getting off the plane and the stewardess was leaned up against the door. She's got a, she said, it's been a terrible day. I haven't been abused once. <laughs> well, there's humor in that. And if you can't see it, you put yourself in another bubble. Uh, I mean, w w when you find yourself inside of the jokes that are endemic to another group of people, You've crossed a major barrier. I mean, when you, I mean, first of all, it's very hard to understand them. You have to, you know, it's, it's, it's an art or it's not an art. It's a matter of experience. But when this black kid who I love dearly looks at me and says, nigger, and passes me more of Thunderbird, which I suspect and I hope none of you have drunk. But if you have, you know what it is. Um, that's crossing a barrier. That's expanding you now. Anyhow. But humor Ralph, often. Ralph and Rain. Yeah. I just want to quickly say, to be responsible for the listening, uh, when people say, I don't see color, I just see you. I feel like that's very different from the experience that I've had with you, Harrison, because often when people say that, I don't see, I don't, rain, I don't see color. It's just like you're a regular person. I well, would, no, that, I, that I would never say. I want to slap them too, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, no, no. And, I see and, rainbows. And in, in, in my interaction with you, I've never felt invisible. I've never felt not acknowledged or invalidated, none of that. So that's different. Yeah. And, no, I mean, yeah. and I would say, um, in your sharing of that story about that young man calling you, saying that, you know, using that word with you. Yeah. He yeah. said it, you didn't. Well, that's right. And so I don't want the people coming up to me using that word thinking they get a pass. No, <laughs> you know? I, I would just, never, I would never use it back. Right. But on the other hand, if you've ever spent a lot of time with street kids, and you know I have. Yes, I know you have. <laughs> oh, uh, nigger is one of these wonderful words that can mean the most hateful thing in the world it can mean i really love you it can mean it's one of these things that slips around now you know part of bursting bubbles is you appreciate when is it appropriate when is it not but on the other hand just being allowed in that privileged environment where, you know, a word like that is not totally bad. I mean, I understand how hateful it can be. And it's the, it's, for me, it's the context in which you're using it. And exactly. It's, it's also my relationship with you. So you well, have created a certain level of relationship with that person that it 
it created something else. But mm. I just I just raised my hand to say, wow, how how powerful is language? <laughs> and it, and 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 it's all about who you're being. Yeah. And relationship. Exactly. I mean, when I look at Thomas and think about life in Sedan, I have wonderful memories, but I often have to say they drink way too much and they feed me too much. But <laughs> is that whatever? Anyhow. Um, Ralph. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Um, Harrison, um, I, I, I am just floored. I love this speech. Uh, I, um, I hope that I can verbalize this clearly. Um, one of the questions that I have, one of the observations of life that I have is that I create my own reality based mm -hmm. upon my core beliefs, <coughs> my social influences, all of the milieu that creates who I am as a human being. But in my life, I also recognize that everyone else, 8 billion other people, have their own reality of existence based on their core beliefs and their the whole milieu that comes together to make each individual who they are. My my um, my my question. Well, let me see if I can verbalize this because it's kind of vague for me, but it's I think it's profound. Um, the process of breaking my bubbles has been a process. 50 years in the making, it has resulted in an exquisite life, a multicultural life, uh, living, li living amongst multiple cultures, actually living in multiple cultures. And I think I'm pretty good about breaking my own bubbles. Um, I, I guess the question becomes, um, is there a format or a, a generalized structure that 8 billion people on the planet could follow that would enhance their ability to break down those bubbles that they live in, the, the realities that they live in, in order to see other people's realities? Is there a framework that you've developed or, or a series of ideas that you think that you found have been beneficial in breaking down those bubbles or breaking down those barriers as we break down our own bubbles? Oh, uh, yeah. That's what we call open space. That's where the principle. I mean, the, the interesting thing to me is that open space started out as a drunken Hail Mary shit. I mean, I had to put on this meeting and on the strength of two martinis, we did what we did. And since then, it's been this incredible natural experiment. And, and all the stuff that has come out has not been a product of my thinking. It's been a product of community appreciation. I mean, the world global, the millions and millions of people who have either done open spaces, participated in them, talked about it, whatever, have, you know, kind of distilled down. So, you know, short take is eight, uh, five principles. But they aren't principles like these are things you should do. These are principles like these are odd things you're going to see along the way. And if I, to the extent that I have any pattern, it's only the experience of that now 50 year experience, which is whoever comes to the right people, whatever happens is the only thing it could have, whenever it occurs is the right time, and wherever it takes place is the right place, and when it's over, it's over. Now, those are not things that I think you set out and say, I'm going to do them. I found it's more a question of just acknowledging the fact that's what happens all the time anyhow. Mm -hmm. And so... A lot of the things we think we have to learn, we already know. We're just being very stubborn and applying it. If I can put it that way. 
Um, Suzanne, Conrad, and Harry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Excuse you know me, me Harrison. <laughs> My mouth starts to go in gear all the time before I thought what I wanted to say. And that truly happened right now. And you also know, those who know me, how quickly cherry eyed I can be. And, uh, and you were talking about the humor you were talking about. I realize how much I miss that humor that you're talking about in a world that is always so careful and cautious and doesn't dare be humorous at times. And I don't mean careless humor. I mean the stewardess's humor and the other humor that you're talking about. And it so goes hand in hand with the bubbles because it makes life tolerable if we take a chance on humor. And don't lose it. And I just felt this enormous grief go through me. Realizing how sometimes we're use, losing touch with the wonderfulness of humor that leads to love and everything else. So I'm going to carry today, yeah, the bursting bubble. But also, hey, let's have ourselves some fun. Be prepared to be surprised. And take a chance on humor in the same way we take a chance on love. So thank you, my friend. I think we begin to know when we burst through one bubble, entering another one, when all of a sudden the humor of the new place is funny. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a story. I was in uh, Ramallah in the, the Palestine. And I was doing a program with Palestinians. And we were at, I love this, the best Eastern hotel. And uh, the participants were all Palestinians. And one of them, very much like myself, likes to get up early and we want a cup of coffee. Well, the hotel hadn't quite gotten to coffee yet. So the two of us, showed up at the door of the kitchen and we could hear that there were pots rattling and but we didn't see any coffee and this young Palestinian turned around to me raised his fist and clenched it and he said jihad for coffee and we burst through and <laughs> got coffee <laughs> That's what we told the people when we were taking this was a jihad for coffee. Um, now, being able to be inside that moment of humor and not even thinking it was strange was a breakthrough moment for me. Um, you know, I, we all know jihad is a terrible thing and so forth and so on. And, all of a sudden, it, it was it was part of the humor that you had to have. I mean, in other times and places, we called it gallows humor, but it, it's more than that. It's a, a way of reframing our understanding of ourselves so we don't take ourselves all that seriously. The stewardess at the door saying, yeah, it's a bad day, I haven't been abused once. <laughs> I mean, come along. That was wonderful. Um, and if, if I told that in certain circles, I would have been roasted and tarred, for sure. And I must say, I've done it in certain circles just to point out the fact that we were being a little bit anal restrictive uh, about humor. But, so any of how are we on time? I don't even know what time it is. And I don't... It's uh, 151. Um, All right. Well, I'm not trying to leave. I just wanted if anybody else wanted to. And I will have to get out of here sooner or later. But Conrad and Harry are next. Conrad and Harry. Thank you. This is Conrad. Yes. Um, how are you today? Well, uh, still breathing. <laughs> That's a blessing within itself. 
Of course. Um, you uh, shared, and it resonated with me as it did with, with Rain when you said you didn't see color. And so I was not going to share. And then I said, I need to share what I see through my eyes. And I see color. And I appreciate color. I, 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 when, when I have been approached with that from a person who is not black, and they say, oh, I don't see color. Um, I often say to them um, that when you don't see color, how I receive it, when you say you don't see color, you don't see the depth of my culture, the depth of my, br my brown skin represents, my black skin represents a whole history of things. And so um, I just want, I really wanted to share that with you because um, to me, when I see color, I see possibility. And I'm clear we are all human beings and yet we all have different experiences on this planet as human beings. And, you know, I don't ever want that to go unnoticed because just to go to just we are all human beings, kind of leaves out a whole lot of stuff, you know? And so um, um, there is a, a poem I wrote, and if it's a short poem, if if I can, I'd like to read it because I think it's sweet. Mm -hmm. And it's called, If I Could See Through Your Eyes. If I could see through your eyes, if I could feel through your pain, if I could understand your world, I wonder, who would I be? How would I then see you? How will I then see me? Would the lens I see through be different? Will that affect my life? Would that enhance your life? I, under, I wonder if there would be a cosmic shift in the world, a transformational birth of my understanding of you and your understanding of me. I wonder, and so I wanted to leave you uh, with that. And I'm not sharing this to make you wrong, because you, you know, see how you see. And that's well. The let me let me just add something here, uh, and thank you for the poem. It's gorgeous. Um, when I say I don't see color, I what I don't see are the attributes naturally associated with looking have you know, slanted eyes or brown skin or whatever. I see colors. Um, and part of that comes out of, I, I spent two or three years in African bush villages. And everybody I knew was a hell of a lot blacker than you are. And, you know, there's beauty in that. I mean, that's the whole culture. Um, and so, as far as I'm concerned, if, if <laughs> we get tripped up on these language things, but it's not that I wipe out racial characteristics or I love skin colors. I mean, some of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life, well, one of them was the chief's first oldest, excuse me, youngest daughter that he was trying to get me to marry because I only had one wife. And he felt that that was pretty bad because I should have five or six like he did. <laughs> and, well, no, my my wife, Ethelyn, came to the village for a period of time. And <laughs> the women took her off and said, what is this? You got so, so big, man. And he only got one wife. And the job of the first wife is always to find the other wives. Well, okay. it, that's the way it works. Right. So, you know, there was all this going on. And, and the chief brought in his youngest sister actually and the wedding was supposed to be i was going to leave the village on a saturday so he told me the wedding was going to be on a thursday the preceding thursday uh, i mean this is a wonderful long complicated thing and she's a beautiful lady so you know the world that, that i've spent i mean color like that in many ways you know there, there's there's deep beauty in black skin and in all skins. And I love it all. 
Um, so that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is just sort of snap judgment that because you happen to be a little bit darker than I am, uh, you have to think in a certain kind of way. And if I, I pass you on the street, I'd better walk on the other side. That uh, doesn't happen for me. I mean, there are times and places when I'm in a dangerous environment and more often than not, it's my friends in that environment who tell me I'm stupid for being there. Um, you know, that happens. And so I take normal precautions, which they do. Uh, and they are typically the ones that get me out of trouble. And I'm typically the one that gets myself in trouble uh, because I didn't perceive the signs. But that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I mean, when all of a sudden the people around you take care of you, then you pass another another thing. And when the chief tries to marry you off to his youngest sister, you're, you're going to throw another loop too. Um, so for me, color is, no, I won't say probably, is definitely not what most people would say, I think, here in the United States. Um, and I don't know whether that makes any sense or not, but when everybody you know over a period of two years is seriously black and beautiful um, or ugly, <laughs> they're ugly black people too. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> yeah, fat ones too. <laughs> uh, that, that makes a very different world. And, you know, and, the, and when all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where everybody can laugh and joke about, well, you know, that a light-skinned lady. And that wasn't a white supremacist talking. That was a, a, the chief's third wife complaining about one of her babies that was a little bit lighter than whatever. Well, and those are conversations that go on in that particular bubble. Um, and where did it come from? Well, I can imagine where it came from, but it's when all of a sudden you are made privy to that kind of discussion and humor, uh, or a, you know, judgments, and nobody thinks it's particularly strange that you know people are talking to you like that, and then all of a sudden it doesn't seem particularly strange to you that they're talking like that. Um, it becomes a rather different environment than. I was growing up in. <laughs> it's the only way I could say. So yeah, I don't I don't see color as an ethnic identifier particularly. I if I I I do see colors. I mean I really do. I I can definitely see my Asian friends who look this way and my African friends and my Chinese friends and my uh, God knows there's old Romy Showerton and she's got She's a typical Brit and very beautiful. And if she didn't look the color she was in, I, I would be very unhappy. I mean, I've known her for a long time. Um, so I see colors in Junie. I, I don't know how I missed you, but there's a, she happens to be Asian and I like her color too. And then we, well, never mind. Um, Harrison, do you have do you have time for for I'm, I'm sorry, Conrad. I, Harrison, do you have time for Conrad and and Harry? Sure, yeah, yeah. So one one more thing I'll just share is that it really is when for me when seeing a person's color, it's it's like the the opportunity to inquire into what is underneath that. Yeah. You know, you're speaking to it, but most of the time when I experience someone, I don't see color that they're not coming from that space. At least mm -hmm. I don't experience them coming from that. It's like, there's a story beneath someone who is African-American or someone who is Asian or so, you know, there's a rich history and story underneath that. And that is what um, I feel we don't engage enough about that, you know? And that's what brings in the beauty of being a human being. 
is so vast. It's not limited, but in this in this culture, it has dominated. What has dominated is white male European, you know, uh, culture. So um, thank you for sharing for sharing that because um, I got that we're speaking the same thing, and um, um, and most of the time it's not. That's not. I don't experience that the case. Oh, that I would agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And Tom, thank you I, for that, the dialogue. I don't know if you saw the cat. There's a request, and I have that request, if you would share your poem on the bulletin board, but also I request that you read it again, but slowly. If you're Time willing read. to do that. Yeah. Well, either yes. read it again or put it on the bulletin board. No, we all have it. Well, wh whichever, I could do both or I could do one. Y'all just let me know. My request is that you do both. There you go. Amen. <laughs> so if I could see through your eyes is the name of the poem. If I could see through your eyes, if I could feel through your pain, if I could understand your world, I wonder who would I be? How would I then see you? How would I then see me? Would the lens I see through be different? Would that affect my life? Would that enhance your life? I wonder if there would be a cosmic shift in the world, a transformational birth of my understanding of you and your understanding of me, I wonder. Well, I can tell you real quick, don't wonder. That's a fact. <laughs> Harry, yeah. would you uh, would you like to to close us out here with your question? Yes, I response? have just I have just one question because I'm I'm so curious that when uh, Harrison says share about lies and knowing the person, it's just that one one question about knowing the person that. Uh, how did you know that you know the person? How did I know that I knew the person? Yeah. I I can think of a number of ways, but the 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 way I the thing that always tipped me off that we were in new waters. And a lot of barriers had fallen down was when we could share humor on dangerous subjects. I mean, dangerous as everybody else would see it. Uh, you know, when, <laughs> you know, humor and what's funny is one of the earmarks of every culture. And what's not funny is, you know, same thing, but going the other way. And one of the clear indications to me that I personally have somehow or another been enabled to migrate out of my bubble into a larger bubble, sharing the cultures of people around the world was when 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 all of a sudden I'd found myself telling a joke or telling using words in a odd sort of way that was clearly endemic to that particular culture, which would ordinarily be um, whatever anathema anath anathema uh, for somebody on the outside to talk that way. It was at that point that I just sort of, I mean, it, it wouldn't be like a flash of thunder or anything, but it would be at that point that I would just sort of, yeah. You know, it was like going into coffee with this Palestinian kid. Jihad for coffee. I mean, he was making a joke. Well, if he, if he had gone down to the Statler or the 
whatever in the United States and pounded on the door and said, jihad for coffee, what do you think we'd have done to him? Locked him up. Um, so I, I won't say this is the only indication that somehow or another you've been invited inside, but it's certainly one of them. Um, um, and the, the funny thing it, to me is how it just sort of sneaks up on you. You don't see it. And nobody comes out with a piece of paper and says, you have now been proclaimed member of the Humor Society. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, I mean, when I was spending all the time out in the bush, uh, if you really wanted to find out what was going, you'd go out to behind the chief's house into what they called the palava hut, which is where the women cooked. And you just sit there. And one by one, from all over the village, anybody who had anything that they wished to pass along would appear. And by and large, you didn't have to ask questions. So it would just sort of roll out. And I mean, that was how I, I knew I was being paired up with this lovely young lady. Because all of a sudden, I mean, nobody ever came up to me and asked me if this would be all right. Um, all of a sudden, it was just very clear that there was this connection between me and her. She'd been in the village for about two weeks. And all of a sudden, I noticed that when it was time to take a bath, she was heating the bathtub. And when it was time for some chop or whatever, she was making it. I mean, this wasn't a servant task. This was just you know, kind of how it was. And because the chief had five wives and I was a guest of the chief, it would be typical that somebody would be doing something like that for me anyhow. But it would be passed around. And then all of a sudden I began to notice there was, there was a very obvious connection. And, and then... <laughs> I can't, I can't t not tell you the rest of the story. Um, as I say, the chief told me on Thursday that we were going to be married on, no, told me on Wednesday that we were going to be married on Thursday. And the chief didn't know that I knew a few things about this. The chief, the year before, had run for clan chief. And he had lost and had spent $10,000 on his election. Now, in African Bush society, all property is common, which meant that if I entered into the family, I would be liable for the 10000 thing and that I was the only person who probably had $10,000. That was that. So I had this interesting situation that I had to think about. Um, the chief wanted me to marry the daughter. Not, you know, she was a lovely lady. I didn't want to dishonor her or make her feel badly. Um, the other side of it was the reason that I was there for as long as I was there was I was doing a series of text of elementary school curriculum materials. I mean, this is at the point where African studies for younger grades amounted to Little Black Sambo, and that was it. Um, so this is a long time ago. So we were putting together stories and artifacts and all that kind of stuff. And the deal was I was there to take pictures that would go into a series of books and we would have artifacts that the villagers would make. And anyhow, it was a complicated thing. And there was a lot, really speaking, a lot of money on it. Um, so I couldn't just sort of say no because that would upend a whole mess of things. So then I had to figure out a way out of all this. So if you have a dispute or a matter of urgent conversation, it's well, the chief said he wanted to talk to me. And if the chief just wanted to talk to me, he would have done this, just talk to me. But if it was a matter of some urgency, we would have gone to his front porch uh, in African bush villages, 
there are precise ways of doing all sorts of things. And if the matter was of urgency and private, we would have gone to the bedroom of the chief's first wife. And if it was a matter of great state interests, in other words, very important, the chief and I would go to the palaver hut at the rear of the house or all the way through the house and everybody else would be cleared away. So the chief and I were back there and I was sitting and in Liberia, when you want to talk to somebody, it's an hour's introduction. You have to talk about everybody's aunt, uncle, relative, et cetera, et cetera. And we got through that. And then we started getting down to what it was really about, which was me marrying this lady. And so I said to the chief, his name was Blema. I said, Blema, you make a very hard problem for me. As you know, I am working with these Christian people over at a church college. They, they looked like the people who were running this project. They weren't. I was, but that's all right. And as you know, Christians don't like these many wives situations. So if I accept your kind offer, I will be fired. And if I take it, I will, I don't take it, I will dishonor your sister. So we have to find a way that will make her happy and not get me fired. Now, he understood that if I got fired, I would have no money, which meant that one of the items on the agenda was off the agenda because I didn't have any money to pay. So it took another hour or two of discussion, but the final settlement was I paid the bride price, which turned out to be one blanket and two chickens. And the lady went back to her village and she was very happy. And I thought she was a lovely lady. And the chief and I parted very good friends. And the book is published. And if you ever want to see it, it's called Red Dust on Green Leaves. And there's even a picture of that lady there. So, you know, the tales go on. Uh, but all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where, you know, this, I was part of it. And it didn't come in any other package. And that was actually over two years that I got into that situation. And it was, it was deep. It was wonderful. Um, Anyhow, so yeah, there are ways. And the more I think about it, humor is kind of, is the real, when you can make a serious joke with somebody else of a different world and both laugh when it's not particularly funny in either of your cultures, you know, somehow now something has changed. Humor, humor is a, it's like stories, good story. Tell a good story and it just leaps cultural bounds. Um, hey guys, go have a good time. Listen to the humor. And uh, there's Audrey. My God, she just showed up. Yes. Audrey, I love Audrey. As you can see, plainly she, she's not a white Anglo-Saxon wasp. Uh, but she has this name, Audrey Hepburn. Now, she has just published a translation of my book, Wave Rider, in Beijing. Uh, there we are. And I think that's wonderful. But she kept emailing me that she wanted to talk about Wave Rider. And her name was Audrey Hepburn. And my computer said, that's <laughs> got to be a fraud. She's dead. And so this went on for a period of time until... A nice lady from Minnesota said, wait a minute, Audrey Hepburn is very much alive and you need to talk to her. So whatever. I mean, what goes around comes around. Anyhow, you're off. Are you in China? Yes, it's 3, it's 3 a.m. now. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, Susanna. Yeah. Audrey, can you show your book? Did 
Do you have your book? Show your yes, book. Yes, yes. Show it. The Chinese book. When are you going to? Uh, where are you going? You're uh, in Europe. Wait, You're sorry. going to for your degree. Audrey, is that where, where are you going? Uh, Switzerland. I will go in to oh, Switzerland. That's where. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the offer from the ETH University. They did. Good. All right. So to get to Switzerland, you have to come through the United States. Yes, yes, that's well, you right. You don't have to, but there, <laughs> it would be very nice if I could see you. Anyhow, thank you. Go to bed. <laughs> Everybody go, <laughs> Everybody go to bed. Anyhow, thank you very much and good luck and Godspeed. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> thank I you so quit. much, Harrison. Thank we, you, we, Harrison. Can, we, can, we can take a picture together. Oh, wait, wait a second. Well, let's uh, I guess okay, put everybody down. We are recording this session. Everybody raise your hands. Yeah. Yes, Yay. Right. Smile, smile, smile. Yes, I'm smiling. <laughs> Stick my tongue out. It's all okay. <laughs> Here we Thank do you, it. dear Harrison. Thank you. Sending love from Wales. Well, I can't think of a nicer thing. Okay. Are you in your new house? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Well, Maybe two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Wonderful. Bye. Bye-bye, Harrison.